For the best viewing and audio experience, we recommend that you use Chrome as your browser for this webinar. Welcome to the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center 2020 webinar series. I'm Rosemary Blizzard, the Business Manager and Communications Director for the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Today's webinar will begin shortly, but I would like to cover a few housekeeping items before we start. Due to the large number of attendees, we have muted participants to reduce audio interference. For better viewing, you may expand or minimize your menu control panel by clicking on the orange tab located on the left edge of the panel. If you have technical issues, please use the chat feature located at the bottom of your control panel to send us a message, and we will try to assist you. Questions or comments related to the webinar may also be submitted using this chat feature. The webinar will be about an hour, followed by a brief question and answer period. Questions that we are unable to address during this live session will be answered in a follow-up document, which we will email to all attendees and also post along with a recording of this session on the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center website as soon as possible. For those that are not familiar with the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, we provide a compilation of best practices and firsthand experiences from jurisdictions that have used this method of voting with a focus on election administration. The website, rankedchoicevoting.org, and our other resources have been developed as educational tools for election administrators, policymakers, voters, candidates, and others. With that, I'll send it over to Chris Hughes, today's moderator, to get us started. Hi, Chris. Hey, Rosemary. Uh, and thanks, everyone, so much for joining us today. We had a record number of attendees, and I uh, hope, expect we'll have a record number, uh, or a record number of registrants and a record number of attendees. So uh, I'm Chris Hughes. I'm the policy director for the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Um, in today's webinar, you'll hear from a panel of election law practitioners on ranked choice voting in the voting rights context. Our panelists bring a wealth of ranked choice voting experience as attorneys in voting rights cases implementing or proposing ranked choice voting as a remedy, as advocates for ranked choice voting, and as legislative drafters working on legislation that includes RCD. Today, they're going to focus on voting rights law, ranked choice voting's place in voting rights litigation, and why ranked choice voting gets proposed as a potential uh, voting rights remedy. If you want to learn more about ranked choice voting itself, uh, check out our website for resources on how ranked choice voting works, the values it's meant to promote, and how it gets implemented, though, of course, our presenters will also touch on those topics in the webinar today. I'm going to read a few intros, and then we will be off to the races. Our first presenter is Angela Gobble, principal of ABG Law LLC. Ms. Gobble represents governmental and quasi-governmental agencies as general counsel, outside counsel, and special counsel. Her representation includes consultation, strategy, litigation, public relations, and best practices advice. Ms. Gobble's practice focuses on election law and defending clients against claims pursuant to Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. She has, defended as out, or she has served as outside counsel for the St. Louis County Board of Election Commissioners and has defended Section 2 clients in the federal district courts for Eastern Michigan and Eastern Missouri, as well as the United States Court of Appeals for the 8th Judicial Circuit. Ms. Gobble currently represents the city of East Point, Michigan, that recently adopted ranked choice voting in the United States of America, the city of East Point. After Angela, we'll have Pedro Hernandez, Senior Policy Coordinator for Fair Vote, where he focuses on voting rights and ranked choice voting. Pedro studies electoral systems and works with community stakeholders to advance reforms that increase representation for all. At Fairvote, he assisted with the first use of multi-seat RCD as a remedy under the Federal Voting Rights Act in East Point. Pedro previously served as the Deputy Director of Fairvote California and worked as an associate at the Law Office of Robert Rubin, where he specialized in claims under the California Voting Rights Act. He earned his JD from UC Hastings, where he served as Editor-in-Chief of the Hastings Race and Poverty Law Journal. Our third presenter is Ruth Greenwood. Ruth is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts and has been working in voting rights for over 10 years. Ruth litigates a variety of redistricting cases with a particular focus on ending partisan gerrymandering and promoting minority representation. Ruth litigated two partisan gerrymandering cases from the trial level to the Supreme Court of the United States, Whitford v. Gill and League of Women Voters of North Carolina v. Rucho, and has advised dozens of states on how to draft and implement independent redistricting commissions. 
Ruth was previously the lead counsel for voting rights at the Chicago, at the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and prior to that, a redistricting fellow with the Democratic National Committee's Voting Rights Institute. She received her master's in law from Columbia Law School in 2009, and her undergraduate law and science degrees from the University of Sydney in 2005 and 2003. Ruth is also a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. Finally, we'll have Michael Pernick. Michael is an attorney in the litigation department at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, where he maintains an active pro bono voting rights practice. He regularly litigates and prepares amicus briefs in redistricting and voting rights cases across the country, and frequently represents and advises public interest organizations on voting and elections issues. Michael is a senior fellow with the Millennial, Pol Millennial Policy Initiative Commission on Democracy and Voting Rights. He serves as a member of the Nassau County Board of Ethics and serves on the board of directors of the Adult Congenital Heart Association. Michael is a graduate of Wesleyan University and NYU School of Law and is admitted to practice law in New York. If you have any questions during any of the presentations, like Rosemary said, please submit them via the chat feature. After all presentations are concluded, we will hold a brief Q&A session. Any unanswered questions will be addressed in a Q&A document we send out when posting the recording of the webinar in about two weeks. Uh, we're covering a lot of ground today, so if there's any topic touched on that you want explored more in depth, let us know and we'll happily look into organizing a follow-up webinar. So without any further ado, let's pass things off to Angela. Good morning. Thanks, Chris. Um, like Chris said, my name is Angela Gobble. I'm an attorney in St. Louis, Missouri. I um, defend jurisdictions uh, in Section 2 Voting Rights Act litigation. And like Chris said, we have a lot of ground to cover. So I will be probably speaking too fast and the information may be dense, but please feel free to ask questions um, or, or go back and let me clarify. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, because it's a huge audience today, I'm going to give um, a basic, very basic overview of the Voting Rights Act and, um, and talk a little bit about East Point, the city that I represent, and the litigation that um, ended with adopting ranked choice voting as a solution um, in mediation in the election that they had in November 2019. So just so we all have a basic understanding of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, um, Section 2 prohibits voting practices or procedures that result in minority voters having an unequal opportunity to participate in the democratic process. So I'm sure all of the, both the federal and the state Voting Rights Acts have all of that in common. Um, what is, um, I assume, unique to the Federal Voting Rights Act is that for a plaintiff to pr prove liability, they have to establish three preconditions. Um, and those preconditions are right from the start need to be stated in the complaint. The first precondition is they're called the Jingles factors for the US Supreme Court case, Thornburg v. Jingles. <clears throat> and the first factor is really the sticking point or an, a point of interest for ranked choice voting. The first factor says the minority group must be large enough to form a majority in a single member district. The second is the minority group must be cohesive, and the third, that it usually defeats, the majority usually defeats the minority. But the first, again, the first jingles factor is a sticking point because it puts single member districts front and center as a proposed remedy under the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, and we'll get into that more in a minute. Like I said, so there's two sort of sticking points or there's two issues where um, rank choice voting, um, there's two points where the issue of a remedy will come up um, under the Federal Voting Rights Act. The first is pre-liability under that first jingles precondition. Um, single member districts are front and center and they're, they're the default remedy for a jurisdiction. So they're, they're sort of the first thing you think about and the first thing you litigate. Um, and then post-liability, things change. There are sort of a couple different lines of cases. There's one line of cases that say pre, uh, issues that you litigate pre-liability um, don't necessarily have to relate to what you litigate post-liability for a remedy. There's another line of cases that says, no, the remedy and the liability are intertwined. And so you have to sort of uh, prove that the remedy is better than the current system 
that the alleged remedy is better than the current system in order to prove liability. So there's sort of a divergence there among, in, among Voting Rights Act cases. Um, I think, uh, like I said, the sticking point, I think, for ranked choice voting is, is the single member districts are almost always front and center in liability, no matter which line of cases the court end up, ends up following. So let me tell you a little bit about my client, the city of East Point. Um, I think a couple of them are in on this, uh, are attending here. And I just want to give a shout out to Kimmy Rich, Heather Ross, and Brian Fairbrother, because they pulled off an amazing feat. Uh, we ended up adopting ranked choice voting and a consent decree in June, and they ran a ranked choice election in November of 2018, uh, 2019, which is just unbelievably quick and they did it well and with a lot of grace. So that's their, that's my first shout out, so I don't forget to do that. But the city of East Point, um, this came up because uh, the city of East Point has a relatively stable overall demographic, 32,000 people in the population. And that's stayed the same from the 2010 census to the 2018 ACS, roughly 32,000 people. Now, historically, elections in East Point are one, the mayor is elected at large, pure at large, and then the city council, there are four city council members. Two council members are elected per term. Um, it's staggered elections, but what makes East Point unique and uniquely difficult, especially for ranked choice voting, is that they're multi-winner elections. So two people were up um, at a time for election. Quickly, because this is not all that important to this um, webinar, the litigation was probably about average speed, I would say, for a Section 2 litigation. The complaint was filed in January 2017. Um, I got involved with the case sort of later in uh, maybe towards the end of 2017, 2018. Um, discovery was held towards the end of 17 and then 18. East Point filed a motion for summary judgment in April 2018. East Point's argument was that um, the minority, minority voters do have an equal opportunity to elect, but often elect um, majority candidates, so white candidates. Um, the judge denied the motion, um, set a trial, just wanted to hear the case at trial, and ordered mediation immediately. So mediation occurred. I believe the party started talking pretty soon after summary judgment was denied and um, agreed to adopt ranked choice voting by June, 2019. The court signed the order, I believe at the end of June, 2019. So the consent decree, one thing to make clear is that the consent decree only covers the city council elections. The mayor is elected at large, first past the post. Um, nothing about the mayor's election changed, but the city council, the four city council members um, elected two at a time are now elected through ranked choice voting. And like I said, this amazing team at East Point pulled this off five months after we signed the consent decree. So why did why was East Point suited or particularly suited for ranked choice voting? That's one of the questions that um, I've been asked to answer. And the key to that is in the demographics for East Point. I hope this chart came through clearly, but what it shows is even though the overall population for East Point remains stable at about 30,000 people, the balance of the demographics has changed dramatically. As you can see here, the, the, the bottom line is uh, the African-American population. So this, is, this ch chart here combines both the census and the ACS. The bottom line is the African-American population, which is rapidly increasing. And the top line, the green line, is the white population, rapidly decreasing. Well, when we discussed earlier, the Federal Voting Rights Act uh, discusses single member districts front and center um, in the issue of liability. Well, and it uses single member districts as sort of a one size fits all solution. You know, that just can't be the case in a jurisdiction that has rapidly changing demographics. Um, you're looking at a situation where, you know, locking in 
for single member districts in a district that has is rapidly the balance is rapidly changing among different minority populations is is short-sighted, I would say, from both sides. So luckily, um, I believe that's something that the parties worked on and agreed on and moved towards ranked choice voting. So these are the, the um, options under the Voting Rights Act. These are the traditional options and more non-traditional options under the Voting Rights Act. The first, um, the plaintiffs have to propose single member districts to get through the liability phase. So in this case, uh, despite East Point having a large minority population, um, the way that redistricting worked is uh, the proposed plan had one of the four districts being a majority minority district. And again, when you look back at the demographics, you can see how that might become problematic. So um, under section two, first you, first you can look at uh, the single member districts, but once you get to the remedial phase or say if you're in mediation, um, you can look at other options. Uh, this case, East Point is in the Sixth Circuit, so Sixth Circuit law was controlling. Um, uh, there is a case in the Sixth Circuit called Cousin v. Sunquist that says cumulative voting is an inappropriate remedy. So considering Sixth Circuit law is controlling, cumulative voting is off the table. Um, Next, uh, a couple of uh, jurisdictions in the Sixth Circuit have adopted limited voting. Um, the Department of Justice brought a case uh, against the city of Euclid and the Euclid School Board. But in this Euclid School Board case, they talked about remedies. And uh, the court preferred cumulative voting over, I mean, I'm sorry, they preferred limited voting over cumulative voting. Um, they had several reasons for it. Uh, I think it was easier for their, the Euclid Board of Elections to adopt or the Euclid Election Commission to adopt limited voting over cumulative voting. But um, that's what the court, the court held that. I think it was implemented. I think everything ran fine. I know the Department of Justice is on as an attendee, so I'm sure they could comment on that. But um, my experience with limited voting, aside from this case, but in general, is I'm not sure that the electorate likes limited voting that much. I mean, I think in general, I don't think that people feel like, I, feel, I think they feel like it takes away their right to participate. Um, you know, it definitely has its benefits. You can talk about that, but I do feel like that there is a sentiment that limited voting, um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's not very well liked among the electorate. So with the options that East Point had, it, uh, it could look at the single member districts, it could look at cumulative voting. Well, it couldn't look at cumulative voting. It could look at limited voting. Or there was this new thing, this newfangled remedy called ranked choice voting, and it could try that. Um, uh, when there were several members of the city council that had heard of ranked choice voting before, there were members of the East Point staff that had heard about ranked choice voting, and they really liked it. So, um, so the city did adopt ranked choice voting and uh, ran their election for November 2019. It was flawless. There were multiple challenges here. As you can see, it's a small city. There was no election software um, that was certified. Chris Hughes at the Voting Resource Center had to get the election software certified. It's a small personnel staff. Voter education campaign was extremely condensed, but robust, and I think it worked really well. So here's the city of East Point now. Here's the city of council. At, um, today. Mayor Owens, uh, she was on the city council. Uh, she was elected mayor, so she was elected through the traditional at-large system. She was not elected through ranked choice voting. This is the current, uh, this current city council. Three of the council members are pictured here. There was uh, council member Baker was appointed to the city council um, when Monique Owens was uh, elected mayor. Um, the consent judgment runs from 2019 through 2022. Uh, we can ask the judge um, to make changes to it if we need to. I get the impression that the city is uh, happy with their choice. I think the election ran flawlessly. Um, several of us were there for election day and I, I think there were very few spoiled ballots. I think it ran well. I think ranked choice voting was a success for the city. 
Um, as far as using ranked choice voting as a remedy or as a solution or a compromise in Section 2 cases, uh, I think the key to that is to make sure that um, jurisdictions and defendants are really educated on what the whole system is. Um, a court has to defer to what the defendant wants. If the defendant wants a legally acceptable remedy or wants a legally acceptable solution, the court must defer to that. So it's helpful if defendants know ahead of time what this remedy is. And bigger than that, I think it helps if the court, if, if the population in general understands what ranked choice voting is and knows how to use it and, and if judges know how to use it, um, or at least have heard of it. So the keys, I think, for ranked choice voting under the Federal Voting Rights Act are just to educate the public and educate defendants and judges as much as possible. Thank you so much, Angela. That was a great start to our, our presentation today. Um, next, we have Pedro Hernandez. Um, hi, everyone. That's a picture of me. Um, uh, my name is Pedro Hernandez. I'm the Senior Policy Coordinator at FairVote. Um, for 25 years, FairVote has been advocating for reforms um, that empower voters in a meaningful way um, to improve their representation. We, like Chris mentioned, we work in collaboration with stakeholders across the country to bring and implement reform. Um, so I kind of want to briefly ha cover some of FairVote's involvement in this space, in the voting rights space. Uh, FairVote has been uh, part of some voting rights cases where an alternative remedy might be used um, in Port Chester, it was helping with the implementation of cumulative voting, which Angela mentioned is another um, uh, at-large modified remedy. Um, the city of East Point, uh, we worked with the clerk and with Angela and others to help develop and help implement an education plan. Um, and in Palm Desert, we're helping implement the education plan uh, for their hybrid system, which incorporates uh, single winner ranked choice voting and multi-winner ranked choice voting. Um, in Higginson, which is a federal case, um, we filed an amicus brief defending the constitutionality of the California Voting Rights Act, um, as well as we filed amicus brief in, an amicus brief in the California VRA case at uh, Santa Monica explaining um, all these different remedies. So we are an advocacy, or, advocacy organization, so I do want to, you know, kind of point out that there is a problem with the current system. There is a lack of competition in many elections. There's polarization. And I think more uh, importantly for this conversation is um, really understanding why winner take all rules can leave protected groups without an opportunity to elect a candidate of choice. So um, I kind of wanted to give a little bit of uh, an example here. Um, <clears throat> The problem tends to be that at-large winner-take-all elections uh, may dilute and submerge the voting strength of a sizable minority. Um, here, you know, you have a voting block of 35% lavender voters and 20% green voters. Um, but the aqua voters, who are the largest group, are if they vote as a block, they could capture 100% of the representation, essentially submerging the other voting groups. Um, <clears throat> so in response to this dynamic, um, back in 2001, the California Voting Rights Act was introduced here. Um, I'm based in San Francisco, so um, I have followed this law pretty closely. Um, and it expanded the Federal Voting Rights Act, making it easier for protected groups in California to prove that their votes are being diluted under at-large systems, um, essentially by eliminating some of the um, requirements that show that plaintiffs have to show that there is a sizable, cohesive, a geographic area for a single member district, right? That's a federal requirement. Um, some of the architects were uh, Robert Rubin of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, who is my former employer, um, and Joaquin Avila, who was probably considered one of the lines of voting rights uh, litigation here in California. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, this is I already mentioned some of these points. Um, <clears throat> the remedy provisions of the California Voting Rights Act, though, are broad, are are broad, and can include a variety of options. Right, uh, district-based remedies, which um, using state and federal criteria for redistricting, 
uh, community engagement in redistricting or modified at large remedies like ranked choice voting and cumulative voting or even limited voting. Um, other changes may be acceptable as well, like changing the election date. Um, the California Voting Rights Act was modified in 2017 um, to give cities an opportunity to have protection from litigation and assess its situation um, by uh, passing an ordinance saying that the city will move to by district elections. Um, that has generally, you know, saved the city some money, um, but also has yielded some mixed results where you have um, uh, officials basically drawing themselves their own uh, uh, districts, single member districts, um, and also capturing a representative district can be di difficult. What I mean by that is that it might be hard to um, create electoral opportunities for these protected groups um, solely using districting. Um, so Fair Vote has worked with community stakeholders in exploring other options when these, uh, when these claims come about. Um, I'll give one example. Um, so in Mission Viejo, they actually went to cumulative voting, but I kind of wanted to highlight the facts in order to help you understand uh, um, so in Mission Viejo, um, it was observed that you couldn't draw a district where Latinos were near 25% of the citizen voting age population. Here you can see the darker shades of green where Latinos are kind of spread out throughout the city. So um, the plaintiff and, and defendant agreed to enter into a uh, agreement to, uh, to, to have the city adopt cumulative voting. Uh, under that system, uh, voters get as many votes as there are candidates, and then voters can um, assign their multiple votes towards one candidate. It is a semi-proportional system, um, often considered a single shot uh, remedy because you, you basically have to have some level of coordination uh, between all the, <laughs> for, for the voters. And you also, when you have more than one candidate of choice, you run into some vote splitting issues. Um, an alternative is ranked choice voting. It, it, you know, under, it has the same mathematical principles, but you don't have that vote split issue. So I think um, some folks wanted to know why ranked choice voting in this context. Um, we, I think we should start off with the thresholds, and I know some folks watching may not agree with this approach, but I think it's important to understand. Under ranked choice voting, winners are determined by these things called election thresholds. Uh, when we elect one, everyone's pretty familiar with single winner ranked choice voting when the threshold to elect is 50% plus one because it's mathematically impossible to have a second person be elected with that same amount. Similarly, uh, when you're electing two, that threshold will go down to a point where it's mathematically impossible to elect another person. So when you're electing two, that threshold is a third plus one because it's mathematically impossible for a third person to have that same amount of votes. When it's three seats are up, it's 25% plus one because it's mathematically impossible for a fourth person to have that same amount of votes. Um, and then we <clears throat> have our voters rank their ballots, their first, second, and third choice, right? Um, and then we count everyone's first choices. If a candidate has more than 25% of the vote when you're electing three people, this is electing three, um, then that person's a winner. Um, it's a proportional system and we don't wanna punish voters who uh, may support a popular candidate as their first choice. So the way it works is that uh, a piece of their vote that wasn't necessary for them, for that candidate to have to win is allocated towards that voter's second choice. So to put it in other words, if every voter has a dollar for the election, but the candidate that they wanted to, to win only needed 90 cents of that dollar, then 10 cents could be counted for their next choice. Um, so that would be the next round uh, where you see the um, fraction of that vote, a portion of that vote allocated for those voters' second choices. And then we still don't have a winner here. So the candidate with the least amount of support is defeated and the votes for that candidate are voted for those voters next choices. And now we have three winners here. 
Um, so that's essentially how it works. Um, we have education materials that we developed um, for jurisdictions that are looking to, uh, to adopt ranked choice voting, both single seat and multi-seat. Um, and th some of those materials were used in East Point and developed for East Point actually. Um, so why ranked choice voting? Well, <clears throat> because it is not a winner take all system, it's very attractive as a remedy because it would allow for a sizable group who votes cohesively to get representation if they meet that threshold of election. It is similar to cumulative voting and limited voting in its mathematical principles, but it would allow for votes to actually be counted for a voter's next choice if their vote, if their first choice candidate doesn't have enough votes to win. Or, you know, you can build coalition uh, as well. There are opportunities for community base building. You know, we're thinking about ways to build power for communities and give them a voice. And, um, you know, um, thinking about opportunities to elect, well, here's a system that, um, is not based in single member districts, but would allow communities who may live across town uh, to be able to capture representation. We also see uh, what we think, well, benefits of ranked choice voting, I should say. Um, we've seen it in single member, we've observed this in single seat ranked choice voting elections. We see campaigns be more civil because candidates may need second choice votes in order to be elected. Uh, elections become much more competitive because People don't, uh, candidates aren't pressured out of running, out of fear that they might split the votes, and it would result in more representative, reflective uh, elections. Uh, voters handle the elections well. Uh, this is some um, numbers coming out of the 2018 June San Francisco special election, where we saw, you know, um, great use of rankings, 86% of voters used at least two rankings, 70% of voters used all three. There were um, San Francisco voters at that time were only limited to three. Now we have, uh, now voters can rank up to 10 candidates if needed. Um, I won't go over all the numbers here. You can look at that in your own time. There is a track record of multi-seat ranked choice voting in US cities. I kind of want to be mindful of folks time. so. Um, I'll, I'll leave these here with you, but, you know, ranked choice voting has had a long history in the American democracy, and it wasn't, and maybe Ruth and others can speak to this uh, a little bit more, but uh, it's used in Cambridge, this multi-seat form of ranked choice voting, and Minneapolis, and at, you know, colleges uh, across the country, um, and now we're starting to see it be used in voting rights remedies, which is uh, really great news to us. We have a piece of legislation in Congress called the Fair Representation Act as well that would use, uh, you know, multi-member districts with ranked choice voting in order to have more reflect of more reflective democracy. Um, this is something that uh, uh, Anita Earls wrote. Um, you should check out that article. It's a great article. But we think that uh, this form of uh, ranked choice voting is equitable and inclusive because it allows much more, many more people to be actually reflected in, 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 their, in their representatives. So imagine that instead of 50% of, uh, of voters being represented, you can have 75 to 85% of voters be represented in an outcome. I think that's pretty powerful. So here's uh, some more information. Uh, uh, shoot me an email. Thanks so much, Pedro. Um, next, we have Ruth Greenwood. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ruth. <laughs> um, I apologize for the uh, the logo, much like myself, has become expanded during the quarantine. It's a little wide. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk to you. I'm a, uh, well, as Chris mentioned, I'm a voting rights lawyer. I do work on partisan gerrymandering and promoting minority representation. Um, and just to try to give you an example of how all of this stuff that we've heard about plays out, I wanted to talk to you about a case I'm working on um, in Yakima, Washington. Now, because the case is ongoing, there's a whole bunch of privileged things I can't discuss, but everything that I'm sharing with you is publicly available um, on websites. So um, maybe there are questions I can't answer, but hopefully I can explain to you what's going on. Um, okay, so this is um, an article from the New York Times um, that looked at uh, Dulce Gutierrez here, who is one of our plaintiffs, um, and it talks about Yakima the city. 
So the city of Yakima uh, was sued by the ACLU under the Federal Voting Rights Act um, in the early 2010s. And eventually they came to a um, uh, decision whereby they would divide the city into districts. And Dulce was the first Latina elected from a district in the city of Yakima. And she was able to then make changes once she was on the board. And so this article talks about how she has made changes and advances after that act. But one of the things that um, the, the plaintiffs in the Yakima federal case noticed, as well as organizing groups like One America that we work with, um, was that um, as um, Angela explained, there is a general um, uh, inertia towards getting single member districts under federal cases. It's not required, you know, formally, uh, but it is often the case that you end up with districts. Um, and it's become clear in Washington that all different remedies um, may be more appropriate, particularly where you have um, non-segregated minorities. And I'll show you some slides to explain that. Um, so um, the people in Yakima were interested in getting more change, not just for their city, but for their county. Um, and so once the Washington Voting Rights Act was passed uh, in 2018, um, this group worked together to think, to think about, well, what's a better solution for us? Um, and so uh, we have worked with One America, which is a group that does organizing, it has been around for about the last 20 years. It does organizing all across Washington state, um, as well as with various individuals. For example, Rogelio Montes was the original plaintiff in the city case. Um, and we said, well, look, let's do some research. Let's have a look at what other options are, are there for you. And so this um, is the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group, um, which is based at Tufts University, which I now live very close to. Um, and so this group ran simulations. They can run thousands and thousands of simulations of how elections would turn out with different systems. And they produced this document called Analysis of County Commission Elections in Yakima County. Um, and in this document, they ended up recommending either three districts with ranked choice voting or one big district where three people would be elected using ranked choice voting. Um, and so this is their website, mggg.org slash Yakima. And you can go and you can draw districts if you like and see the different percentages that you get. The, the thing to focus on here is this is the county of Yakima. The city is in this um, center part, almost where the yellow and blue and green uh, meet. Um, and so this was the recommendation from the experts. But what, what's, the, what's going on here? The thing here is this shows you the population dispersion of the Latino community. And so you can see in the green area, which we know would be a majority minority district, according to these numbers, there is a large Latino population. But the city of Yakima, which is just north of that green district, um, also has a large Latino population on the east and west sides. And so there are people in those other districts who wouldn't be able to elect their candidate of choice um, if we went, if the city of Yakima changed to have three districts. Um, only the people living in the green area would be able to elect their candidate of choice. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit more, you can see even more this east side of Yakima um, is the area where Dulce lives um, and is in particular the, the, the area where there are people who are uh, agitating for representation. And so when they looked at this and they looked at the numbers from the report from MGGG, um, the group decided that they would prefer ranked choice voting. So partly it's to try to make sure that everybody in the community can be enfranchised. It's not just people in one certain area. Um, the, there's also the thing here, I mean, I've just put these three points out that you can vote for anyone regardless of where you live. Um, so that's the point about, there's also um, a Native American community that isn't big enough um, to elect their own candidate of choice, but they regularly vote with the Latino community. And they, I'll just go back, um, generally live, you can see down uh, bottom left, there's the Yakima Reservation. Um, uh, and so that community in the yellow district also wouldn't be able to elect the candidate of choice of the Latino and native um, communities because it would be outside the district. So one of the real interests here was, hey, we can all vote together even though we live in all different parts of the county. Um, another real benefit was this idea that they don't have to redistrict every 10 years. Um, at the moment, there are districts drawn up for the primaries, but then everybody votes at large in the general. 
if they changed to ranked choice voting, then you wouldn't need to draw districts ever. You would just have a population. And as it grows, this is something Angela mentioned, as the population grows, the, the people that win will be responsive to what the community populations are. I mean, you could also imagine a case if the Latino population grows enough that it will be all of the districts could be majority minority Latino. And then the white population wouldn't be able to elect their candidates of choice. So this way, the underlying balance of the population are able to elect their candidates of choice. Um, and then the third point here is that you can elect a county commission that reflects the community, but without incentivizing segregation. Um, I'm not sure that people would necessarily move from the, you know, the blue or the yellow area down to the green area to be able to elect their candidate of choice, but maybe, right? Certainly people who want to run for office may move down to that area. Um, and then that perpetuates something that we've heard since the 1960s is a real problem, segregation, right? So the Fair Housing Act and the Civil Rights Act were trying to reduce segregation and have more integration. But if you have more integration, then this traditional Voting Rights Act remedy of single member districts becomes problematic for the exact communities you're trying to protect. Um, uh, so um, the last thing I'll show you is when we actually looked um, at just some very basic numbers in Yakima, um, it was really obvious why ranked choice voting could be helpful. So if you look at the 2018 uh, countywide votes for the for commissioner, um, the total number of votes was 67,814. Now, Pedro has shown you the numbers. Basically, if you were electing um, <coughs> three people, then each of those people would need about 16,953 votes. In that actual election, Susan Soto Palmer ran and received 27,000 votes, right? She clearly has huge support in the county, but because in they were just using yes or no, there was a majority for the other candidate, she didn't get a seat. Susan Soto Palmer is um, in this suit as well and has done a lot of work um, as an activist in the Latino community. And so the, the idea here is that you could change a system and actually there's a person there who's ready to go. I think um, what Angela said is really important. Um, right to choice voting is something that the election, you know, um, commissioners, the people who are running the elections need help to understand. and People like the Ranked Choice Voting Resources Centre are fabulous at helping on that. But then also the community needs to understand, you know, if you speak to a community that's been historically disenfranchised or, or I turn up, hi, I'm, you know, White Ruth from Australia. Hi, um, you know, you're now enfranchised, off you go, you should vote. That, that doesn't tend to work. <laughs> um, better is to have groups like One America and people in the community work together to make sure that there are candidates that want to run, there are issues that are clear that the community is interested in, um, and then people know when they go out and vote that their vote will actually be effective this time. Um, and then it's something that you want to do ongoing education around. Um, and so uh, Yakima, as I say, is this lovely community that has a very vibrant activist group um, who are working together and trying to educate as many of their, their fellow activists as, as they can, even though we're all under a quarantine. Um, so that's why ranked choice voting can be really helpful in Yakima County. Um, and the, after Washington passed their Voting Rights Act, Oregon has now passed a Voting Rights Act that also allows for remedies other than single member districts. Um, and there are already people there who are like, oh, wow, wait a second, maybe this can help us as well. Um, so hopefully this is a way that we can keep um, uh, adhering to the goals of the civil rights movement from the 60s, trying to make sure that people can vote and that vote can count, but also making sure that people can have a meaningful vote and can elect somebody that is the candidate of their choice. Um, and the hope is that we can do this sometimes through federal litigation, but also through extra state protections in state voting rights acts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ruth. Uh, and now our final presentation, Michael Pernick. Thanks so much, Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Pernick. Um, today, I'm going to provide an overview of the New York Voting Rights Act, or the NYVRA, which is currently pending in the New York State Senate. First, I'll walk through the provisions of the NYVRA, and then I'll speak about a few of the ways in which the NYVRA opens the door to alternative remedies like RCV. Uh, but before I get started, I want to thank my friend Chris Hughes and the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center for hosting this webinar and, and all that you do. And I also want to give an additional shout out to Chris and to my fellow panelists, Ruth and Pedro, for providing incredibly helpful feedback on the NYVRA while we were working on it. Um, so first, why enact a Voting Rights Act in New York State? 
Um, significant portions of the Federal Voting Rights Act have been invalidated by federal courts. Uh, many of you are likely familiar with the Shelby County decision, which effectively invalidated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. That's the section that mandated preclearance. In her dissent in that case, Justice Ginsburg famously called the majority's opinion akin to throwing out your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Uh, second, the portions of the Federal Voting Rights Act that remain intact, uh, most notably Section 2, make it difficult to litigate these claims. The cases are extremely complex, they're expensive, they take a long time. I, I live in the town of Hempstead in New York, and we have a district-based system for our town council elections that was the result of Section 2 VRA litigation. That case took 12 years to litigate. Uh, in the Hudson Valley, a little, little bit further up north, a school district currently defending a Section 2 case predicted they would need to spend $6 million to defend the lawsuit. Third, New York does have a history of voting-related discrimination. People think of New York as a progressive state, but we have a history of English literary, literacy tests and property requirements for voting. And even today, we have among the lowest registration and turnout rates in the country, with significant and persistent gaps in registration and turnout between white and minority voters. Finally, state-level VRAs have been effective elsewhere. The NYVRA builds on best practices from the California Voting Rights Act and other state-level VRAs, but actually would go farther in a few significant ways, which I will walk through today. Let me say something about the current status. The bill was introduced in January by Senator Zeller Myrie. A, a huge shout out to Senator Myrie for his leadership um, in, in introducing this legislation. The Elections Committee in the New York State Senate had a hearing in March that brought together advocates and experts from across the state. Um, obviously, much of this legislative session has become focused on COVID-19 issues, but we know there's a lot of interest in the bill. Um, it already has uh, uh, gathered roughly 15 co-sponsors, so we're excited to see where it goes. So now I'll tick through some of the key provisions. Um, the NYVRA institutes into law what is referred to as a democracy canon, the idea that we should interpret laws in ways that are most favorable to voters. This, this concept is particularly timely now in, in the age of COVID-19. We're, we're seeing courts across the country being forced to grapple with election laws that were simply not written with a pandemic in mind. Now, all courts dealing with these issues should follow a democracy canon and, and construe laws in favor of the right to vote. This provision would make it required in New York. The NYVRA creates a new state level cause of action for voter suppression which would address voting practices that deny or abridge the, the right of racial or ethnic minority groups to vote. For example, this provision could be used um, to prevent a local board of elections from placing poll sites in white communities while failing to place poll sites in communities of color. Um, or it could be used to prevent a local board of elections from engaging in um, voter roll maintenance or purges of voter rolls in a manner that disproportionately disenfranchises um, voters of color. Uh, next, the NYVRA creates a new state-level cause of action for vote dilution. Um, this cause of action would allow changes to be brought against uh, both discriminatory at-large structures as well as discriminatory district-based maps. For example, it, it could be used to challenge an at-large structure in a municipality with a significant minority community that has gone unrepresented because it's consistently outvoted um, by the white majority. Um, along the lines of some of the examples uh, uh, some of the other panelists have spoken about today. Um, or it could also be used to challenge a municipal legislative map that, for instance, may crack a large minority community into a number of different legislative districts, preventing the community from electing a candidate of their choice. The NYVRA would allow a plaintiff to prove uh, a vote dilution claim in a number of different ways. First, a plaintiff would be able to prove a violation um, simply by showing the existence of racially polarized voting. This is drawn directly from the California Voting Rights Act. It's worked really well in California, um, so we were uh, able to build on that best practice. Alternatively, a plaintiff can prove a violation by showing under the totality of the circumstances that the ability of members of the protected class to elect their candidates of choice is impaired. Now, this is akin to the Senate factor analysis that's um, part of the standard 
uh, used in federal courts to evaluate uh, Section 2 claims. The NYVRA would also resolve many of the thorny questions that add complexity to federal vote dilution litigation. For example, the NYVRA would explicitly allow coalition claims. It would explicitly allow both statistical and non-statistical evidence to demonstrate racially polarized voting. And it would prohibit certain defenses, such as the partisanship defense, where some jurisdictions try to explain away racially polarized voting by saying that their voting patterns are just based on partisanship. So in, in short, the vote dilution claim is designed to protect voters and make these claims more straightforward um, to reduce cost, burden, and expense of litigating these cases for all parties. The NYVRA also creates a notification and safe harbor process. Um, so what this means, before anyone can bring a voter suppression or a vote dilution claim, they would first have to send a notification letter to the jurisdiction. The jurisdiction would then have 50 days to pass a resolution committing to address the violation and laying out the specific steps they would take. Um, a plaintiff would only be able to initiate a lawsuit if the jurisdiction fails to pass a resolution um, or fails to actually remedy the violation after passing the resolution. The NYVRA creates a statewide database to maintain election data. The database would be housed within the State University of New York system and is modeled on a similar database in California. Now, this is particularly important in New York because the database would collect and consolidate election data from roughly 2,000 jurisdictions, counties, villages, school boards, each of which currently hold their own election data. It would also convert census demographic data to New York State's political boundaries. This would make it easier to identify jurisdictions that might be in violation, and it would allow for data-driven decision-making by policymakers across the state. It would also reduce the expense of litigating vote dilution cases for plaintiffs as well as defending jurisdictions. Um, next, the NYVRA expands language access requirements. We have incredible language diversity here in New York State, uh, but some of the language minority groups are not currently provided with the, transli the translation assistance um, that they need when they vote. The NYVRA would expand the language access requirements to cover any jurisdictions in which at least 2% of the voting age citizens don't speak English well based on census data, or at least 4,000 voting age citizens don't speak English well. Next, the VRA would establish a preclearance program. Before preclearance was struck down by the Supreme Court, um, the Section 5 uh, of the Voting Rights Act was the most effective civil rights law in the history of our country. The New York Voting Rights Act would create a similar preclearance program for certain jurisdictions in New York State. These jurisdictions would need to first obtain preclearance either from a judge or from the Civil Rights Bureau in the New York AG's office before making certain changes to their election laws. For example, changing the method of election or creating new policies about purging voters from the rolls or changing the hours or days of early voting. The, N the, the NYVRA would not require every jurisdiction to obtain preclearance. It would only cover certain jurisdictions, which um, I've, I've listed up in, in this slide. Now, this program, um, as it did at the federal level, would, would not only stop bad practices, but would also help jurisdictions and election administrators make better decisions on the front end and with the confidence that they're not hurting minority voters. Last but not least, the NYVRA would create a new civil cause of action for voter intimidation. If there are deceptive ads or intimidating practices that keep voters from the polls, this would allow for a civil cause of action against the perpetrators. So that's a quick overview of the NYVRA itself. Now I'm going to turn to rank choice voting and the NYVRA. At the outset, New York State is not new to alternative methods of election. New York City recently adopted ranked choice voting for its elections, and as Pedro mentioned, the village of Portchester in Westchester County uses cumulative voting as the result of Section 2 uh, litigation. But generally, remedies to Section 2 claims in New York have been district-based. The NYVRA would pave the way for more jurisdictions to transition to alternative systems um, like ranked choice voting. So let me show you how the bill would do this. First, the definition section explicitly defines alternative methods of election to include ranked choice voting. 
as well as cumulative and, and limited, limited voting. In the remedies section of the vote dilution claim, um, the alternative method of election is explicitly listed as one of the acceptable remedies. So this would make it abundantly clear to a court, um, to parties, that, that ranked choice voting is a viable option. Um, but the remedy section goes even farther. As Angela explained in current voting rights litigation, courts will often give a level of deference to remedies proposed by the defendant jurisdictions. The NYVRA would open up the process of crafting a remedy. It says that courts should not give blind deference to remedies just because they're proposed by defendant jurisdictions. Instead, it would require courts to consider remedies proposed by any of the parties as well as interested non-parties. This would create an opportunity for advocates and experts to educate courts as well as parties on new options like ranked choice voting, and it would empower courts to craft the best remedy for each jurisdiction. Because as we've seen, every jurisdiction is, is unique and every jurisdiction has different um, uh, uh, residential uh, and geographic patterns. The NYVRA would also create a mechanism for jurisdictions that might be in violation to transition without the need for litigation. Under current law in New York, it would be very difficult for most jurisdictions in New York to transition to something like ranked choice voting. We have a patchwork of overlapping state laws that establish precisely how certain local uh, jurisdictions should operate. For example, New York's town law explicitly lays out the modes of election available to towns. The default is a traditional at-large system, and they can only transition to a ward-based system with a voter referendum. These procedures would make it nearly impossible for jurisdictions to affirmatively remedy potential vote dilution violations without litigation or a court order. The NYVRA fixes this. Any jurisdiction that might be in violation of the NYVRA but lacks the authority under New York state law to implement a remedy on their own would be permitted to enact what's called an NYVRA proposal, which would lay out exactly how the jurisdiction would like to fix the potential violation. The jurisdiction could pass an NYVRA proposal either after they receive a letter from a, uh, from a potential plaintiff or they can even do it on their own volition. The proposal would then go up to the Civil Rights Bureau in the New York AG's office, which would evaluate it and grant approval if it remedies the potential violation, if it's lawful, if it doesn't result in retrogression, if it's feasible. And once it's approved, the jurisdiction would be permitted to go ahead and enact the proposal, notwithstanding the patchwork of other state laws that would otherwise constrain the jurisdiction. So what does this mean for ranked choice voting here in New York? Well, it would create a pathway for any jurisdiction with an election structure that may result in vote dilution to implement ranked choice voting without the need for a lawsuit um, or any, any court order. So to, to conclude, th this bill is really exciting. It's still in its early stages, um, but we're excited about it for a lot of reasons, one of which is the possibility of paving the way to alternate remedies like ranked choice voting. I, I also understand that there are some policymakers in a number of other states that are already looking at this bill as a model to replicate, which is really exciting to the, to the folks in New York who have been working hard on this. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that people have today. Also happy to connect with folks separately. You can feel free to email me directly. Thank you very much for tuning in and thanks Chris and, um, and your team for all of your work on this. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks a million to all of our presenters. We, uh, I, th I think that was really like super informative. We covered a lot of ground, like I said at the beginning. And I know we're already at the scheduled hour. Um, I've asked our presenters if they can stay on an extra 10 minutes so we can squeeze in some Q&A. So we'll be doing that. Um, of course, there will also be a recording for this webinar that will be up in about two weeks on our, um, on our YouTube page, which you can get to by searching Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center on YouTube or going to the webinars page on our website, rankedchoicevoting.org. Um, so with all that said, let's dive in on the Q&A. Um, any Q questions we don't get to because we got a lot of really great questions in the chat today, which uh, is always nice to see. We got a lot of great questions, but we certainly won't get to all of them. We will put together a document answering, providing answers to all questions, whether they're covered during the Q&A now or do not get covered. And that will come out with the recording as well. Um, I do also wanna note we had 112 people on the webinar at one point, which is 
like an enormous record for us. Very exciting uh, to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, and glad we had uh, such a great engaged audience for the webinar. So with that said, let's get to the questions. Um, the first one is a little bit of review because you know we covered a lot, but Jack Santucci asked, are single member districts explicitly written into the Federal Voting Rights Act? Like, are they in statute or uh, does the requirement for them arise from case law? So I'm gonna throw that to Angela and Ruth, if you have anything to add. Uh, so the answer to that is- uh, Angela, you're muted. Oh. I heard you, it was just delayed on my end, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay, so the answer to the question is no, um, single member districts are not written into the statute, but the very um, first case that the United States Supreme Court used to interpret the statute is Thornburg v. Jingles, and that case exp explicitly relied on and mentions single member districts. I'm a little curious, do they say in the case why they defaulted to single member districts? Like, what's the reasoning behind that? I should have reread the case before today. Um, the, the main thing I think in that case was that was what they were asking for as a remedy. If oh, yeah. plaintiffs had said, look, we actually think we can do this differently. They also referred to um, a law review article by um, Jim Blackshear and Larry Menifee that specifically set out like, hey, here's a way you could test. You, know, you could set, you could look at what the current situation is as against single member districts as a standard for testing. Um, and so that just became the standard for testing. It's not clear that it has to be, right, by the statute, um, but that has been used until now. And it was really a problem at the beginning because communities were so segregated. Um, there weren't the issues that we have now where there are places that aren't sufficiently segregated, but we still see racially polarized voting, which is you know part of the problem, whereby um, candidates of choice of the minority community regularly get defeated. Right. Uh, the second question was super interesting. Um, I think it's, it touches on a lot of topics, um, but I'm interested to hear, Pedro, your answer and Angela as well. So from John Safarli, in many voting rights lawsuits, the plaintiffs argue their vote is diluted because elected officials are not geographically proximate to the plaintiffs, as in elected officials are concentrated in a single high-income neighborhood. These plaintiffs argue that dilution can be remedied via single member districts because they ensure that uh, whoever's elected from those districts will be close to their voters. What's the response from uh, people working on ranked choice voting uh, to that argument that voters' interests can only be truly represented by someone who lives close to them? So Pedro, um, and then if anybody else has anything to add. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, I feel like that is a, um, a fact-based response, meaning that you would have to look at that jurisdiction in the context for that jurisdiction, because not all jurisdictions are going to be the same in terms of its representativeness of where a person might be geographically living. Um, that said, we are mostly concerned with w where the voters are and their ability to influence an outcome of the election. So, um, there are folks who are actually part of this, um, who are attending this, who have done a lot of research on where folks uh, and representatives have lived. And I do think that every plaintiff probably looks at where representatives live in terms of uh, uh, geographic representation and what that looks like. But I would actually be m more concerned with the actual voters and their ability to actually influence the outcome of an election and elect, because just because I live in, Noe Valley in San Francisco, it doesn't mean I might like someone from the marina, you know, who might, who I feel represents my interests. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think, so, and it's a balance, right? Like some people really care about neighborhood representation. Some people really care about more community representation or, or citywide representation. So I would say it's a, it's a case by case uh, analysis. I would add to one thing we've seen from Cambridge is that they still get a good diversity of geographic representation, even though they're using at large ranked choice voting for their, their city, it's not called a city council, their legislative body, um, even though they're electing at large. Um, 
I don't know how closely tied that is to ranked choice voting, though I should note Jack Santucci, who is uh, who studies ranked choice voting is a, a ranked choice voting academic and an expert, said that you could argue that proportional representation elections, multi-winner RCB, other forms, and neighborhood representation are compatible. There's papers in comparative politics on this topic, including some on the type of ranked choice voting we're talking about today, um, that you see parties running in, you know, the regions where they're going to get the most votes or um, splitting up their candidates, um, parties, uh, ethnic groups, splitting up their candidates throughout a city um, and sort of running their candidates in different parts of the city. That remains to be seen how that plays out in wider use in America, but we've seen that in Ireland where they use multi-winner ranked choice voting. And that, that that goes to like just conversations about campaigning and how to win, right? So you want to win, you got to figure out what your win number is, and you got to figure out where you're going to get those votes in order to win. If yeah. what it takes to win under multi C, you know, is attainable by going through two certain neighborhoods across town, you're going to get representation for those neighborhoods across town. Um, if the votes that you need are to represent. Uh, a, a section of town, then you're going to be canvassing that section of town for those votes. Right. Um, Angela, another question for you um, from Steve Chesson. On East Point, were any of the uh, council members elected in East Point African American? And can you talk about the results more generally? Oh, Angela, you're muted again. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the East Point City Council, before any changes, traditionally, um, was uh, Monique Owens was elected in 2018. Um, maybe she was 2017. One of the East Point people can chime in. But she was elected. Um, she's the first African-American candidate. However, she's not at all the first minority preferred candidate. Uh, there were multiple minority preferred candidates. They were Caucasian that were elected. Um, after the change to ranked choice voting, the change to ranked choice voting. Angela froze for me. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Under the at-large system. Angela, you we lost you for a second um, right after you said the change to ranked choice voting. So... Um, Let's see, where do I start? So <clears throat> Monique Owens ran for mayor under the old at-large system. She was elected at-large to mayor. The city council elected um, Sarah Lucido. Um, she's Caucasian and Harvey Curley, who is also um, Caucasian. Mm -hmm. so, the results okay. of the election, I believe, Basically, um, a, a, um, Monique Owens is African American. She was elected at large to the mayor um, seats, but um, were I haven't done an analysis of the actual election results to tell you who the minority preferred candidates uh, were that were elected. My suspicion is that minority preferred candidates were elected. Sarah Lucido has always historically had a strong showing among um, minority voters. And my suspicion is that remained true. Um, so that there were minority preferred candidates that were elected, they were just not, they don't identify as minority. Mm -hmm. that is and, and, yeah, and I would add that for like, for some state VRAs, like the analysis is in federal, it's like about voters ability to elect the candidate of choice not necessarily what the, the, the demographics of the candidate are, but the voters themselves of, of, in their ability to influence the outcome and have that opportunity to elect the candidate of choice. Thank you. Um, we're, we're running out of time again, um, but we've still, let me grab one of the other questions I saw in here. Oh, um, Ruth, you already replied to this in the chat, but I wanted to have you uh, cover it for everybody just in case people aren't looking at the chat. Colin Cole asked, one of the, sorry, my chat box is cut off for some reason. Give me one second. Uh, 
did you, I mean, I can go through it if you like. I, I got it. Uh, but anyway, one of the Yakima remedy options was adopting both districts and ranked choice voting when usually it's just districts as we've discussed. What did the MGGG data show that made it important for the district option to involve ranked choice voting? Um, yeah, so I actually later in the chat posted the notice letter and the MGGG report, so you can go and look at it in all its detail if you would like. Um, and so yeah, in under the Washington Voting Rights Act, you're required to suggest remedies. Um, and so we suggested the two recommended by MGGG. And so the, the question here was, well, what, what's a, of benefit to using ranked choice of voting in a single district versus just first past the post? Um, and the main answer to that is vote splitting, right? If you have um, what, two candidates of choice of the minority community running, but then one other candidate um, could end up being a plurality winner, right? You can get 30 percent, 30 percent, and then the, the, you know, the white candidate of choice gets 40 percent and gets elected. If you use ranked choice voting, those votes would flow across you know, to the other candidate and you can ensure um, that in, in this case, the Latino community can elect a candidate of their choice. Um, and just MGGG looked at some of the historical election returns and said that that seemed like something that was likely. It's actually a pretty active Latino community. Lots of people want to run, um, which is great. Um, but if the votes get split, then then that sort of defeats the purpose of, of trying to change the system. Right. All right. Well, we that's our extra 10 minutes. Um, we still have more questions, but I want to let people get on with their days. Thank you again to our presenters for all of your work and for putting together such great presentations today. Um, like I said, we'll have the recording out in a couple weeks and make sure to subscribe to our mailing list if you haven't so you can get uh, the email when the presentation is up on our website. Thanks again to everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye.